Welcome back to What You Will Learn. My name is Adam Ashton. And my name is Adam Jones. Today, we're taking you through the best bits of the 21 Irrefutable Laws of Leadership by John C. Maxwell. Follow them and people will follow you. Whether you are a follower who is just beginning to discover the impacts of leadership or you're a natural leader or you're already in a position of leadership and you've already got a whole bunch of followers, these rules can really elevate you to the next level. Uh, They're all about becoming a better leader and leadership is really a skill that anyone can learn. And the big thing about leadership, it's really the thing that's going to determine your effectiveness over your whole entire life because the lower your individual ability to lead, the lower the lid of your potential. And the higher the lid, the higher your potential. Makes sense. This leadership is like the lid on what you can achieve. So, it doesn't matter how good you are in all other elements, leadership is what's going to hold you back. So, if your leadership ability is an 8 out of 10, then that's the highest you can get. Your personal effectiveness overall is never going to really be above an 8 out of 10. Of course, it doesn't matter how good you are. If you're a 10 out of 10 in everything else, but you're a 4 out of 10 in terms of leadership, then everything else, you're going to be capped at a 4. So, there's an interesting story here from two brothers. They had this tiny little restaurant which was getting a bit of success in Los Angeles. So, they went to build a much larger facility to expand their menu to include now hot dogs, fries and shakes. They included barbecued beer, pork sandwiches, hamburgers and all these other items. Did you say barbecued beer? (laughs) Maybe barbecue and beer maybe. Barbecue beer. (laughs) Barbecue beer. That sounds delicious. That's what it says in the notes, man. (laughs) Well, must be true. <laughs> their uh, their annual sales, their revenue was uh, about two hundred thousand at the time, and the brothers themselves they were splitting this fifty grand in profits. Now, back in the nineteen forties, that's a hell of a lot of money. Doing pretty well, um, and that was really like they they put the that amount of money put them in the town's like financial elite. They were these these top dogs in the area. Um, in nineteen forty eight, their intuition told them that things were changing a bit in the restaurant business. So they actually went the other way. They stripped their menu back. They got rid of the barbecued beer and they just focused on the burgers and a few sides as well. A bit of fries, a bit of shakes. They eliminated plates. They got rid of glassware, metal. They switched everything to paper and plastic. They really simplified everything. They focused on this speedy service system and their business boomed. Once they'd stripped everything back, their revenue in the mid-50s was hitting 350000 and uh, the two brothers, Dick and Mac, they were taking home a hundred grand in profits, which is, again, a hell of a lot. So, this speedy service system was one hell of a system that they put together. Their kitchen really became an assembly line. It was one of the most innovative things that really anyone had seen in the restaurant business. And if you drove up in the shop in in one of those days, you would have seen the, the sign right there and it said McDonald's hamburgers. So, Dick and Mac, obviously, they hit the jackpot and the rest was history, right, with this system they built up. You'd think so, you'd think so. We know it uh, quite well today. There seems to be a McDonald's on every street corner, uh, but it wasn't just solely reliant on Dick and Mac. Dick and Mac, that actually tried to franchise out their model. Uh, they had four or five franchisees that had a crack at it, but it just wasn't working. Um, and they were really sort of, while they could nail it themselves, they couldn't teach anybody else to nail it. So, they were pretty good restaurant owners themselves. They knew how to run a business, make systems efficient, cut costs, increase profits, but really they were efficient managers, but they weren't really leaders taking it to that next step. So, they actually did find a partner with a leader whose leader potential was way above what the McDonald's brothers were. Yeah, Dick and Mac, they'd smacked right up against their lid. Uh, This law of the lid, their leadership abilities was what was holding them back. And it wasn't until uh, Ray Kroc came along who had a much higher lid. Uh, his leadership ability was far greater and he could take these two brothers and uh, he could uh, really blow them up to something massive. Now, if you've seen the movie The Founder, you know that Ray Kroc is a bit of a douchebag. He did a lot of dodgy stuff uh, and he was a pretty mean-spirited sort of a bloke. But uh, regardless of all that, great leader, <laughs> very very <laughs> high lid and he made McDonald's boom. Yeah, where the McDonald's brothers, they had a crack at franchising and got no luck. Big Ray, when he came along, in four years, he opened 100 restaurants. Four years after that, it was 500. And obviously, today, there's over 31,000 at the time of writing. So, let's just round it up to 50K at least <laughs> in 199 countries. Basically, every country in the world, you can find it. And bloody hell, it's quite impressive. Every time I go to Bali, Indonesia and try a cheeseburger and it tastes exactly the same as you would in Australia as it would in the US, um, they've got some incredible systems that have been scaled up all over the world. So... 
success is really within reach of just about everyone, but it's the lid on our potential is what caps us and that's the, the leadership abilities is what's holding us back. So if you want more success, the, the recipe from John C. Maxwell here is to improve your leadership abilities. Wherever you're looking, you're going to find smart, talented, successful people, but they're only going to have limitations on them because of this lid of leadership. So in this episode, we're going to be talking all about leadership and the ways that we could be lifting our lid to become more effective and increase the potential of our effectiveness in our life. So what do leaders look like? You probably think they look powerful and charismatic, a bit like Asho over here, <laughs> six foot it. six. 110 kilos of just a big that's, ball that's of a bit muscle. generous as well after, and, after Corona. And IQ, let's go with seven foot actually. He's a big boy. <laughs> you might think that's what it looks like, but it might be actually deceiving on first appearance. I didn't mean that. <laughs> you are a leader, but to someone who looks like our show. Well, that's it. You can't, just by looking at someone, you can't really tell. Uh, if you saw a frail little old lady uh, who's, you know, 60 years old and a little bit uh, hunchbacked, and you, you might think that they're too weak, they're too frail, they couldn't possibly be a leader. But then, of course, you got the, the big bad Mother Teresa who was this little old tiny frail little lady, but she dominated. She was serving the, the poorest of the poor and she was a true genuine leader uh, to, regardless of how she looked. Yeah, she'd get up on the microphone and literally be not afraid of offending anybody because she had this interesting ability. When Mother Teresa spoke, everyone just mm. shut up and listened because she was a real leader and this is what happens when leaders speak. Everyone just shuts up and listens because leadership, it's influence and nothing more and nothing less. Yeah, this frail little old lady, she's been described as the quintessential energetic entrepreneur who has perceived a need and done something about it, building an organization against all odds uh, that has branched out all over the world. Her organization, the Missionaries of Charity, it's in 25 countries across five different continents. In Calcutta alone, she's built homes for homeless children. She's had a center to help people with leprosy. I didn't even know leprosy was still around. I thought mm. they'd got rid of that. Uh, she's got a home for the people dying, people suffering with tuberculosis, mental disorders. She's done all of this being this one tiny but great leader. There's an interesting TV series that's based on a true story called Band of Brothers on HBO that I must jump on at some stage after reading this book. But in the first episode, straight away, there's a lot of contrasting styles of leadership that's on display. First, you've got Herbert Sobel and his East Company's commanding officer during his training. He's brutal. He's basically a serious bit of a dick, I guess, and, uh, and enjoyed inflicting punishment on his team. And he did it mercilessly, which you think is fine, like when you're preparing him for combat, trying to toughen him up. But the thing is, he didn't really push himself at all in the same kind of way. And he was kind of chubby and seriously an incompetent person, barking down orders to all the soldiers who were improving in their competence and everything like that. So they had no respect for him. And just before the Battle of Normanby, when they were meant to shoot the Germans, they were actually taking bets between themselves. Who's the first person <laughs> who's going to shoot this dick, Herbert? <laughs> That's it. He was. Uh, he sounds like an absolute dick. And the next one we've got uh, was uh, from the same series, another leader uh, who was leading them into the Battle of the Bulge, Lieutenant Dyke. Uh, so the first bit, Herbert was a dick. Dyke is a pussy because he was just taking walks. Uh, whenever the team needed the most, he just seemed to be AWOL. He seemed to be uh, doing something that didn't need to be done. But wherever he was, it was as far away as possible from the real action. So it's, you know, you, you've seen Team America, how they got the dicks, the pussies, and the assholes. This is <laughs> the first one was a dick, the second one was a pussy, and basically both of these leaders uh, were completely ineffective. They didn't have any followers. They were just uh, there because they had the title, they had the position. And finally, thirdly, we've got another dick, this time Dick Winters. <laughs> <laughs> big Dick Winters. Big Dick. <laughs> big big dick, dick who actually wasn't a dick. Yeah, he wasn't a dick at all because he was known to be the best combat leader in World War II. And that's because time after time, he helped his men perform at the highest level. And he had this saying, officers always go first. Mm. So whenever he told his troops to run into the battle up against trenches, against machine gun fire, he didn't have other people in front of him. He was the one leading the charge. Yeah, so you got the first bloke who was just sitting back barking orders. You got the second bloke who was nowhere to be found. But then you got the third bloke who was actually at the front of the troops leading them into battle. So just very obviously, you can tell who was the, who was the best, most effective leader of that group. So the thing to take away here is followers, they're always watching what you do as the leader. It doesn't matter if you're leading an army as Big Dick Winters was or <laughs> if you were a parent, you probably realize that your children are just always watching what mm. you do. 
And it doesn't matter really what you say. You might tell them things and advice like the the first example we had. And if you're doing the opposite, contradicting mm. yourself, they're going to watch what you do, not watch what you say. And if you're a boss who's got some employees, you can issue all these memos of the world, give these motivational speeches at your Monday morning meeting and everything like that. But the rest of the people of the organization really won't buy in unless they see you as the leader putting all your energy and effort into the organizational goals. So leadership is vitally important regardless of your position, whether you're leading an army into battle, whether you're leading a business or as you say, whether you're leading a family as a parent or as a teacher at school, there's a few myths about leadership. Firstly, uh, the management myth. Leadership is not the same as management. There's this widespread misunderstanding that leadership and management are interchangeable, that they're the same thing. You might pick up a leadership book, but really it's just a management book. So management is about keeping systems going. If there's uh, if there's rules in place, the managers can keep them going and keep the discipline. But the leader is the person that can actually create something new. They can create change. They can see a different direction, lead a team, and the team's going to follow them in that new direction. So leadership's not necessarily management, but it's actually not entrepreneurship either. And this is another assumption a lot of people have. Entrepreneurs, yep, they're good at seeing great opportunities and going after them, but that doesn't mean that they're good with people. In fact, many entrepreneurs find it necessary to find a partner or some kind of senior employee to partner with to handle the people side of the business. The idea that knowledge and that the most intelligent and the smartest person is the leader is also a big myth as well. So, while Sir Francis Bacon, he says, knowledge is power. You think that the most knowledgeable person has the most power, but when it comes to leading people, that's not true at all. IQ or your level of education has pretty much nothing to do with your abilities as a leader. And the biggest myth of all is that leadership has got everything to do with the position you hold. That You need to be a CEO running a big organization or someone leading a team or managing a team. It's not that at all. You could be actually a graduate or the very bottom of an organization and display all the leadership in the world. The title at the bottom of your email signature or on your business card or the, the name that you throw about that you're the manager of this or the director of this, that's got absolutely nothing to do with your leadership abilities. The true measure of leadership is actually influence. Nothing more, nothing less. Leadership just means that you've got people who are willing to follow you. Margaret Thatcher, who's the former British Prime Minister, she observed being in power is a bit like being a lady. If you have to tell people you are, then you aren't. Yeah. If you have to go around saying, I'm oh, a leader. leader. Yeah. <laughs> then- if you have to whack it in your Instagram profile, <laughs> yeah, exactly. which some people, or your, um, a lot of people will see it on LinkedIn, like leader in their yeah. title. If you got that, then unfortunately, you're probably, <laughs> you're not. probably not a leader. <laughs> exactly. So there's an old leadership proverb that says, he who thinks he leads but has no followers is only taking a walk. You might think that you're this great pioneer leading people to the top of the mountain, charging ahead. But if you look around behind you and there's no one coming with you, then you're just taking a little casual stroll. Michael Jordan understood what it meant to follow a good leader. During his final years of his playing career, he was adamant about his desire to play for only one coach. If anyone watched The Last Dance, which I think was about half the planet, uh, you'll remember that when Jerry Krause fired Phil Jackson, MJ retired too. He says, no, nah, he could he had offers, he could have gone somewhere else, but he said, no, nah, I'm not playing for anyone other than Phil Jackson. So MJ believed Phil was the best in the business and didn't want to work for any other leader. Because when... When Jordan first started playing, he was co- he was playing under Doug Collins. So he was the coach from 1986 to 1989, and the whole game plan here was just get it to MJ and he'll score <laughs> and he'll kick ass. And he MJ- was a real sweaty guy, wasn't he? I think mean, he was. <laughs> <laughs> but when he was coach, MJ really ran the show because he was a stronger leader than Doug. But it all flipped around when Phil Jackson was coach because Phil was actually a stronger leader than Jordan, and he said the quote. I don't anticipate you're going to be the scoring champion in the league. The spotlight is on the ball. If you're the guy that's always going to have the ball, teams can generate a defense against that. And he said, we have to find ways to make the other guys better. We have to create threats. And it took time for Jordan to agree, but eventually Jordan succumbed to Phil Jackson's advice. So strong leaders are only going to follow someone who is a stronger leader than themselves. As you said, Doug Collins wasn't as strong as as MJ, so MJ was running the show. But when someone stronger came along, MJ fell into line and everybody was better off. These things don't happen by accident. If you're at an 8 out of 10 in terms of your leadership, the 9s and 10s aren't going to be following you. And if, of course, if you're a, a 3 or a 4, you've got no choice but to bring only the 1s and the 2s along with you. I've, uh, I've had that experience as well when I once had a 
manager who was quite a poor manager, I thought. And because of that, I was compelled to leave. But as soon as a stronger manager came in and she's uh, an incredible leader, I feel much more compelled to, to hang around. So there's this magnetic kind of repulsion, I think, when you're managed by people who are weaker leaders than yourself. Because in general, followers are attracted to people who are better leaders than themselves. And this is the law of respect. Now, respect can come at a few different levels. If someone respects you as a person, they're going to admire you. And so, if you see someone who's really good at what they do and you like them as a person, they're going to admire you. If you respect someone as a friend, they're going to love you. So, if you can build that level of relationship with someone, it goes beyond admire, it goes towards love. But if you can get someone to respect you as a leader, that's when they're going to follow you. Henry Kissinger, he remarked, a leader who does not deserve the name unless he is willing occasionally to stand alone. So, looking at respect there, Ash Joe, if someone is just going along with the crowd, obviously that's not a leader. The ones mm. who are ready there just to sit there and to stand for what's right, even at the risk of failure sometimes or the risk of great danger or even relentless criticism. You need a bit of risk and a bit of courage, obviously on the bigger things, but there's another basketball story here. Um, John Wooden, the famous uh, college basketball coach of UCLA, uh, a superstar player came along named Bill Walton. And as a young man, Bill Walton, he had this big, thick beard, but Wooden, just as a, a rule of discipline, he didn't want anyone on his team to have a beard. So uh, Walton, he attempted to assert his independence. He rolled up to training with his beard and Wooden said, mate, you're going you're gonna to have to shave that off. Mm-hmm. And uh, Wooden said, well, I'm keeping the beard, so I'm going to have to go. And Wooden stopped and thought for a bit and he said, we're going to miss you, Bill. It's nice, <laughs> nice knowing you. So it was that, that courage to take that big risk, uh, to risk le- having a star player leave the team to show that he was a strong leader. And of course, next training session, Bill came back nice and cleave shaven, baby faced again. Uh, and clearly, John Wooden was a stronger leader than Bill. Yeah. And Bill was happy to follow. So, right now, we can measure our level of respect we're getting from a whole bunch of people. And if you want to measure it, the first thing you should do is look to the people who you're attracting. So, a bloke from the pub, Dennis Preer, he remarked, one measure of leadership ability is the caliber of people who choose to follow you. So, when you ask for a commitment or a change, what are the people doing behind you and what are the type of people who they are? As you say, like with... uh Phil Jackson, he told MJ, hey, you're a superstar, but I don't want you to win the points championship. I want the whole team to win. And MJ eventually followed by. With John Wooden, he had that request. Everyone's got to come without their beards, clean shaven, and it was everybody eventually followed. So there's some pretty obvious measures. If you just ask for something small, do people follow you? Do they do it or do they rebel against you? That's going to be a clear indicator of your level of respect and your level of leadership. Now, everyone's heard of Henry Ford. His quotes are probably littered on almost 30% of books we come across, <laughs> I reckon, because he revolutionized the automotive industry. He was a serious innovator, serious legend. He obviously co-founded the Ford Motor Company in 1903, and he's really r- the reason all of us have got uh, cars and motor vehicles at the moment. That's a story that everybody knows, but there is uh, a lesser known part of the story, and that's uh, despite all of his positive achievement, Henry Ford wasn't really a leader. He didn't want to make any change. He didn't want to make any improvement. He didn't want to empower anybody around him to take positive steps. In fact, there was one time when uh, an engineer had made this prototype of a new car that he thought was better, a new and improved model, and he was showing it to everybody. Henry Ford got into such a rage, he walked up and he ripped the door off the hinges and proceeded to smash the car with his bare hands. And uh, yeah, that's That's ridiculous. That's pretty pretty messed up. (laughs) Imagine like pulling something out that's better, being this young and up and comer, yeah, and just getting it torn down by the legend Henry Ford. Yeah. So for twenty years, the Ford Motor Company designed only one car, and that was the Model T. Uh, and that's obviously because anytime anyone came with something new, Henry was literally ripping it apart with his bare hands. So obviously, when it started, they grew their own market. It was a full blue ocean. They had a hundred percent market share. But a few decades later, in 1931, the market share was down to only 28%. So, 40, he he was the antithesis of an empowering leader. And only a few generations later, his grandkids were the ones who actually took over Ford and empowered others and made him a successful business that's still around today. So, rather than identifying up-and-coming leaders and building them up, 
he was actually constantly undermining anybody who showed a little bit of potential. He was always looking over people's shoulders, always tweaking, always tinkering, always meddling in people's business. He wasn't actually able to build somebody up and say, here you go, here's a bit of responsibility, go out and do this. He was sapping people of their leadership potential. So if leaders want to be successful, they have to be willing to empower others. Theodore Roosevelt, he said, the best executive is the one who has the sense enough to pick good men to do what he wants done and the self-restraint enough to keep them from meddling with them whilst they do it. So to lead others well, it doesn't mean micromanaging them and jumping all over them. It means being on their side, encouraging them, giving them power and helping them succeed when they need it. The true measure of a leader isn't how good you do yourself. Obviously, Henry Ford did really well himself. It's really about how well do you empower others to keep that going on. There's a couple of barriers, of course. A a little bit of a barrier to this is a bit of insecurity. Of course, if Henry Ford was worried that this uh, new bloke who'd made this brand new car that could have been the one that over overthrew the Mold T, maybe Henry thought he could be out on his ass. But mm. that, I think that just shows a bit of insecurity. Yeah, well, in the 48 Laws of Power, number one is never outshone the master. <laughs> which so is that really, guy stuffed up, didn't he? He, <laughs> he did, didn't he? should have done a little bit better. Absolutely, he could have. But that's kind of the antithesis of what the law of empowerment is, right? Like a lot of leaders in their quest to become more powerful Human nature has it that you are going to be a little bit insecure when someone Mm. a little bit younger, a little bit fresher, a little bit more attractive and a little bit more talented is doing better things than you. It is hard to swallow that and just let that person come up. But if you're a real leader, that's something you need to do. Yeah, another big barrier to empowerment is a bit of resistance to change. Uh, And uh, there was a Nobel Prize winner that said that as we grow older, we actually protest against change more and more. Obviously, Henry Ford, he dominated, he created this Model T, this legendary new invention, but he was worried that something else could come over and overthrow him. So, he was extremely resistant to change. He didn't want any progress. He didn't want anything that was, uh, was slightly better than his own invention. He just wanted to keep it the way it was. He wanted everyone to drive a Model T forever and ever. Another barrier for empowerment is the lack of self-worth. John Pierce, another bloke from the pub. Is it the, oh, no, it was Dennis before. Dennis Pierce. I wonder Dennis, if they're related. He's pulling out names here, I think, Johnny. <laughs> could be made up. But you can't lead a cavalry charge if you think you look funny on a horse, which is very true. Yeah, it's, quite, so it's very hard deep. to lead if you're self-conscious because the moments where you get to be, be contrarian and stand out and the moments of risk... Yes, you just might look like a bit of an idiot on a looking funny on a, a bit of a horse, <laughs> but that risk is necessary. As Brené Brown would say, you need that vulnerability to be able to take off your coats of armor to step into the arena, and sometimes you will look silly and you will cop a bit of blood, sweat, and dust. Leadership is something you develop daily, not in a day. So there was a young bloke uh, named Brian who was at one of John C. Maxwell's seminars. He was this enthusiastic 19-year-old. He was full of ambition and enthusiasm, uh, but he had a bit of a lid. He didn't quite have those leadership abilities yet. And uh, John said to him, listen, Brian, I believe that in 20 years, you can become a great leader. You know, I want you. I want to encourage you to make yourself a lifelong learner of leadership. Read books, listen to tapes, go to seminars. Obviously, it's a bit old. Listen to tapes. Maybe listen to podcasts. Watch a bit of YouTube. Uh, but uh, when, whenever you come across a golden nugget, some kind of truth or significance, write it down, file it away somewhere for later. Because in five years, you're going to show some serious progress, and in 20 years, people are going to look and say, "How the hell did you come so wise overnight?" But the whole point here is that, of course, you don't suddenly become wise. It's a long process process of doing a little bit each and every day. Like a lot of things, leadership, it's like investing. It compounds and it's something you need to work out every single day. If you hope to, it's just some silver bullet that one day, if you listen to this and you want your lid to be much greater than it is today, if you're sitting at a four and you want to be a nine, unfortunately, there's never going to be this silver bullet that's just going to jack it up all the way to nine. What matters is what you do day to day through the long haul. If you continually invest in your leash development, it's like letting your assets compound and the inevitable result is growth over time and people are going to think, how the hell did this person become such a naturally good leader? 
Some people might think, oh, I'm just not a natural leader. I just wasn't born to be a leader. That's for somebody else. It's reserved for those elites, the people who are at the top of the top. They're the leaders I could never be. But of course, if you look at leadership as a skill, you can realize that it is something that you can get better at. It's complicated. There's a lot that goes into it. Respect, experience, strength, emotional strength, skills, discipline, vision, momentum, timing. All of these things are required to be an effective leader. But you've got to, you've got to realize that all of these things are learnable by doing a little bit each day by always reading, watching, listening, observing people around you, you can become a strong leader over time. Everybody has the potential. It can't be accomplished overnight. There's a quote here, champions aren't made in the ring. They're only recognized there. At the end of every month, we send out a, an email, which is a recap of the month just gone, where we give a bit of our brutal feedback, a bit of brutal honesty. We give the books a rating out of 10, where you can see what Adam Ashton thought of the book and you can see what Adam Jones thought of the book. And we also give you a teaser as to the four or five books that are coming up next. So if you want to be one of the first to know which episodes are coming up next, sign up to the email list where at the end of each month, you'll get a recap email. Head to whatyouwillearn.com slash email.